in Argus yet, so then yep. it could spin around. So. Gotcha. So now I see uh, Robert is going down on the winch, and I'm um, dive, dive, dive. This is an audio slate for dive number hotel 1907. UTC time is 040430. Mark. Even if I'm in an incognito window? Bold, yeah. <laughs> it's quite the voice. Yeah. I'm logged in here. So, I get um, bolder to make sure I talk over everyone. <laughs> yeah. What I didn't mention there, Antonella, is um, I made note of the ship heading when we launched. Okay. And I got that burned into my little reptile brain, so if everything goes pear-shaped, I still have that in my head, so I, I know which way I need oh. to turn to run away. Okay. So already we've got some surface current there. Right. So we write in what it should be, not what it is. Ah, okay, and got it. So I can just... You're looking at just... So now I'm watching my um, two aft cameras in uh, Herc and Argus. Okay. And, and I'm obviously uh, below Argus, which is desirable. The tether's a little bit looser than it should be, so... But that's because the current has us and it's swept us around. Now we're we're now looking west a bit. Okay. And also because I have stick lock on, and the ROV doesn't respond very well when you do that. <laughs> so you're getting a feel from the current, both from how hard you're fighting to keep her where it needs to be or the tether or are you looking at dp or mm. combination no i'm watching basically to make sure the ship doesn't take off so okay. i get that information from the ship um speed over ground gotcha so i know the ship's heading and i know its speed should be gotcha okay and then if i get out of the box there like i um wasn't thrusting down as hard as I could, so I can go so dead stick on my forward for a minute and use really all the power to the verts. Okay. Gotcha. I don't have auto heading yeah. on because the currents now swept swep us all the way over here. Oh, okay. But it's it's not uh, there's nothing I can do about it. Like if I tried to fight it, I would be using all the laterals and uh, the motor would be getting yeah. hot so at no time have we really gone over 50 degrees okay okay a, sub a subsurface current so you don't really need auto heading in this case because it's sweeping us around there if i did there would be one vertical going full and one not going so I'll, I'll keep an eye on that as well okay what i'm oh, okay. in addition to the um I'll stop 5 zero. you guys ready for control? Ready for control. Ready for control. Okay, go ahead and bump it. Bumped. Let's take it at, uh, let's go 15 meters a minute for... Okay. See what this current does to us. So that's a note for uh, recovery and once we got down. That was happening. Roger, thank you. Yeah, Reg. Took us a few dives when we were here before to figure that out. Somebody came up with the, what is it, the equatorial oh, yeah, something current. Yeah. Okay. Great. Gonna hit dive. Is that okay, pilots? Okay. RV, can you confirm your sub bottom uh, is at display range? Is that 200 meters? Um, it is not. I will range up. Thank you. And Miso. Okay, it is now.
So there's um, Argus behind her where it should be. There it is. Perfect. Yeah, we've gone done a complete 180 now. One thing that's not on our checklist is to zero the tether in the 6-8. Oh, I zeroed the 6-8. Right. Um, but not the tether. You can uh, speed up a little bit now. Let's go okay. 20 meters a minute. Thanks. Roger. So that's a gotcha here too. I just went to extend the camera and it's set for some reason on starboard box. Oh. Oh, with those encoder. Yeah. It's that's. Gets me every time. <sighs> does it start up in that? I don't know. Mode? If you reboot uh, top side, I think it does. So it probably did that when I rebooted top side okay. for. Uh, I'm going to make a note for my GUI list. <laughs> yeah, it's real annoying when you press a button and you're like, nothing's happening. And then all your core tubes float away. Yeah, they're all rubber banded in. Oh, that's good. y'all hear me? I'm just doing an audio check here. This is uh, I did not hear the beginning of that. Loud and clear. Did not hear the beginning of it. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Well, welcome, welcome everyone. As you can see, the sub is back Are you in muted? the water. This is Dejana Figueroa. And I want to give you an update on our status. So we are beginning our descent. Um, this current dive will expo explore an unnamed, unexplored seamount south of the Palmyra Atoll along a 6.7 kilometer transect. We're going to be going upslope from a depth of approximately 3,750 meters. We're going to head toward the summit of the seamount, which is at approximately 1,900 meters depth. The flanks of the seamount are marked by several tall, steep-sided, cones that may provide rock sample materials that are really important for us to understand the geological history of this particular seamount. Additionally, the summits of these cones will be explored for the presence of suspension feeding biology, like deep water corals. My new found favorite, Steve. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> Those deep water corals. Changing my hearts and minds every day. Right? And um, the sponges are pretty cool too, which are typically found in higher densities along local topographic high points. This seamount was chosen as a dive target to better characterize the geological underpinnings of the Line Islands region. So again, hello, stay tuned. We are starting our descent to an unexplored seamount south of the Palmyra Atoll. You're still muted. Do you want me to turn them? Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I don't have Can you hear me now? I, just yes. I am not doing a commercial for <laughs> Verizon. I'm just, just checking in to make sure y'all can hear me. So hopefully you heard that great introduction of what we're going to be doing today. Um, just real quickly, we're going to be exploring an unexplored seamount south of the Pomera. 
at all. So it should be pretty fun. And on watch with me today, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce my science team here in the back. Let's start off with you, Jordan. Oh, we're missing. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Oh. I'm, I'm over here working on the camera thing, but I can participate. <laughs> Let's start off with Jordan. Oh, uh, hello. My name is Jordan Akiyama. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service based out of Honolulu, Hawaii. In the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, it takes part in the conservation, restoration, and preservation of the Pacific Rim Island Marine National Monuments, where we're currently at, as well as Paimaro Atoll National Wildlife Refuge, where we are currently, I believe, 40 miles south of at the moment. So, thank you for joining us. Steve? Hello, everyone. Uh, yes. Watch lead and lead scientist uh, for the cruise, Steve Oskovich. Um, I, as I mentioned, I'm watch lead for this uh, four to eight watch during the majority of our descent today down to uh, 37, 50 meters or so. Uh, I am a postdoctoral researcher at Boston University where I'm w working on deep water coral biodiversity and biogeography in the Central Pacific region. Um, so this is one of our, my particular favorite study areas to work in. Um, excited to start the dive here and hopefully reach some new depths. Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Lippett. I'm sitting in the data logger seat for the four to eight watch. Um, I'm a marine geology PhD student from the University of Rhode Island and I'm here to help characterize some rocks for you guys. Rock on with the rocks. <laughs> also, I must introduce, if it's a good time, um, the person responsible for making sure you get all of this amazing video footage. We've got video over here. Uh, yes, I am Tammy Gomez. I am, as she said, the video engineer. I. You guys all had like nice long intros, and I'm like, uh. <laughs> I'm also a marine biologist, but I mainly sail as a video engineer, and I currently live in Seattle, Washington. So we, we come from all over. That's right. Thanks for sharing where you're from. I, did, I forgot to add that to my little introduction. So um, I'm serving right now as the Science Communication Fellow, Dejana Figueroa, and I'm from Los Angeles, California. Uh, like I said, I'm from said Honolulu, already. Hawaii, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> born and raised. Uh, Steve, where are you from? Uh, right now I'm living in New York City. So a little bit fur from my office in Boston, but... <laughs> And, uh, you know, COVID times, strange. So work from home is a, still a real thing for me. Yeah, and as I said, um, I'm at the University of Rhode Island right now, but I'm originally from Albany, New York. All right, yeah. so New York, Hawaii, we've got a, lot, a little bit of everything here. I think the first row is a little busy right now, but we'll introduce the first row in a little bit. But um, we're so glad you're tuning in to join us for this dive. I already got a couple questions coming in here. I haven't read through everything yet. How long is this dive expected to last? The last one went about 24 hours. This was a little bit faster. Um, so we'll be in the water until midday local time tomorrow. So that'll be about 18 hours in total. We have a bit of a shorter dive track uh, than yesterday. So, uh, and we have very specific targeted sampling um, goals. So hopefully we should be able to accomplish those very early on in the dive and then uh, you know, enjoy the, the rest of the exploration as we get to the upper reaches of the seamount. 3,750 meters, that's pretty deep. So um, our descent right here, are we talking about two hours, a little bit more than two hours? Uh, yeah, we have a few hours, probably two, two hours at least, two and a half hours likely. Depends on our descent. I think we're doing 20 meters per minute, so we can do some quick math and find out approximately how long it's gonna take us to get down there. All right, that's a challenge, some quick math. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can figure it out, our destination. I challenge the listeners out there to I send us the answer. 
<laughs> the depth we're um, attempting to go to is 3,750 meters. And then what rate of descent did you say? Just to repeat that for our viewers. We're at 20 meters per minute, right? 20 Girl. meters per minute. Good luck. Can double check that here. Get those calculators out. Do it. Stevie, I mentioned before that this is one of the deepest recorded dives in this area? It may be. Maybe. Uh, so if we make it down to uh, 3750, it will most likely uh, be, well, it will be the deepest dive that I'm aware of in the Kingman and, and Palmyra unit of Prim. Yeah, we... We're just kind of one-upping ourselves these days. I was just going to say previously set by <laughs> us. Previously set by uh, <laughs> us about 24 hours ago. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Um, did anybody actually do the math on that? We've got somebody coming in with approximately 187.5 minutes. 3.125 hour, 3 hours to the bottom. So we should arrive at approximately 9.20-ish. <laughs> so our current time. We have an adjusted uh, vertical velocity oh. of 26 meters per minute. OK, now. we're going to have to make an adjustment with that calculation. Yeah. Sorry, folks. <laughs> That's an adjusted vertical <laughs> velocity <Redo>. of 26 <laughs> meters per minute. Wait, yeah, meters. Yes, that seems really slow. Meters per minute, yeah. Okay, 26 meters per minute. Yep. They're starting to come in. About three, if they're giving us three hours, like about three hours. Super excited to watch this stream again. I heard that this seamount is unexplored and unnamed. I'm curious. Does the crew get to name the seamount, or who does when we're going on unexplored and unnamed areas? So, uh, kind of make it a habit of not uh, assigning names to seamounts. We just kind of give them tentative working titles uh, so we can understand what we're talking about geographically. But uh, there is a proper procedure for formally naming seamounts. Um, I have to look it up now. And it does take a while uh, to properly name a seamount and go through all the paperwork. You have to provide some, uh, a bunch of data, usually a map of the seamount as well as uh, some supporting documents for you know why it might be named that and not something else or prove that that name hasn't been assigned to another feature, for example. Sounds like a lot of paperwork. It's taking a lot, a lot of, of paperwork. Time. So what do you call it in the meantime while you're waiting for all of that to go through so that you can easily identify your area of study when communicating with it's others and colleagues? You know, I, I, I think unnamed Seamount, uh, while uh, you know, it is going to be its unofficial working name for now. But, you know, for example, if we're doing cruise planning, we might name it, you know, Seamount 1, Seamount 2, or Seamount A, B, C, etc. Um, but this one never really got a part of that naming convention because we really didn't expect to be spending this much time in the farthest southern portions of the monument. We're down here primarily because of weather uh, up north. So we're trying to make the most of this exploration by... Uh, diving to the depths we need in areas that are understudied uh, or unexplored and uh, try to acquire the samples we need and give us some information about what's down here in the monument. Got it. So to answer your question about naming, there is a procedure in place, but as researchers, there's some sort of common agreement of how to identify it verbally amongst each other. 
until that gets C mount one, C mount two, A, B, C, or whatnot. So there you have it. We've got an update on our uh, time here, time calculations with the adjusted vertical velocity. We've got people reporting 2.4 hours with that increase in vertical velocity. So 2.4 hours. That's great. That's right. All right where we're on it. Blue water down to the bottom. What information did you use to target this particular unexplored region? Can you repeat the question? What information did you use to target this particular unexplored region? Um, I think they're referring to what I said that typically uh, your sponges and corals might be found in higher densities here. Oh yeah, so I mean, geographically, th this area is a bit further south than where we were yesterday. Um, there's been very little exploration done in, in this area and on this particular cluster of seamounts we're working on. Um, but the kind of more on a more fine scale, the specific dive track we chose uh, starts at a deeper depth, uh, kind of around the base of the seamount and works towards the summit. And the particular side of the seamount where we're on has the most kind of interesting slope topography and these kind of volcanic, possibly volcanic cones, um, which suggests that, you know, the steep sides of these features might indicate that there's good opportunities for sampling rocks and not sediment covered. Um, you know, for example, as we saw at some of the locations last night on our previous dive, um, but also the, the tops of the peaks of these cones uh, sticking out into the, you know, the currents around the seamount could be great places for suspension feeders to, you know, filter feed and uh, suspension feed uh, since currents will usually wrap around or wrap over um, some of these points that jut out into the water column. So we're going to try and hit as many of these peaks as possible. Um, there are a couple of valleys uh, along kind of between some of these peaks. They're very short at this particular seamount, but even the valleys, uh, depending on how current scoured they are, they could, you know, have different types of habitats that we would want to characterize like uh, nodule beds or something like that, um, which we haven't seen yet, but um, there are models to suggest that, uh, and there are other data to suggest that deep sea, oh, there's a pelagotheria, the one that I was telling about the other day, um, sea cucumber. But uh, yeah, so there could be different types of habitats in these valleys that we wouldn't normally see if we just went up, for example, the steepest slopes of the seamount. So we try to pick a, a bit of a diversity of habitats because some species will only be found in those particular habitats and it adds to the overall species inventory present here within the monument. Moving from science to the front row, don't know if it's a good time, but I'd love to introduce uh, the front row, the ROV pilots and the navigator. And I have a couple of uh, ROV questions coming in. So first off, if it's a good time, go ahead and introduce yourselves. I can uh, get started. ROV is getting settled in with some pilot training, but I can start. How are we, what are we including in our intros? Oh, Today. our names, our positions, what we do, and where we're from. Oh, where, perfect. Where do we live? Okay, uh, Samantha Wishnack, uh, currently a navigator on the 4 to 8 with this delightful crew. Um, my day job is operations coordinator for the Ocean Exploration Trust, which is the nonprofit that owns and operates Nautilus. It's my seventh season out here, um, and I am from the Monterey Salinas area. And I have to give a shout out to my mom who's watching right now. Okay. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, and RV's getting settled in. Uh, Antonella's on the Hercules seat for some pilot training. But once the RV team's ready, they can jump in with their intros. Sounds awesome. She's not getting pilot training. She's just getting familiar with her. She owns her own RV. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So this is Dan. I'm sitting in the Argus chair today and getting familiar with Argus. 
Oh, yeah. There's a lot going on over here, and I forget where all the buttons are. It's frightening. Where are you from, Dan? <laughs> uh, just um, the guy who wandered in the control van. Yeah, I, just, <laughs> I wandered onto the ship one day, and yeah. I never left. <laughs> Oh, you want to know where I'm actually, like where I yeah. live? Yeah, like, where, <laughs> do oh. you live here? I was like, kind a follow-up question. He's kind of living here. Do I, you live I, on I Nautilus? didn't hear the first part of that, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm from Oregon, oh. out in the sticks, about uh, two and a half miles from where the pavement ends and the foothills. Some mountain range that I can't remember at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Close to a lake, I can't remember the name of that one either. <laughs> Do you remember anything? Well, he remembers his name, guys. We're good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of bad people again? after me, so I, I don't want to give any oh, specifics. Uh, we've been out for how many days? Uh, I can't remember that yeah. either. <laughs> you're out probably. You're out a lot this year. Yes, ma'am. I, I win the prize. I beat Rennie this year, which is really hard Ooh. to do. That is. Wow. Herc pilot? Hi, Mantinella, currently sitting in the Herc seat um, from Los Angeles, I guess. <laughs> Although <laughs> I sort of don't live anywhere right now. Boat is person. That, is, that <laughs> <laughs> is there any more to that? Uh, from Where are you from originally? Oh, what I'm, do, I'm originally from LA. Yeah. And I do ROV work in marine robotics and autonomy, um, kind of a, a smattering of things. Nice. Software genius. <laughs> no. no. I feel genius. like there's lots of genius in the room right now. Just saying. Just saying. Only evil genius. <laughs> <laughs> you calculating. <laughs> Questions about education. Like, where do we go to school? What types of degrees do we have, if we have any? Or what type of experience? So here I am in the Science Communication Fellow Chair. And um, I went to UCLA and got a degree in marine biology and then went on to get grad to graduate work at UC Santa Barbara in marine science and then postdoctoral work at uh, UC Santa Barbara as well and UC San Diego. And I'm now currently teaching. So it's kind of my background and path in terms of education. Thank you, Kim. Speed up on Argus a little bit. Right here. Sorry, I should be at uh, no, you're zero fine. alert. Should I continue that? Uh, I have, my background is actually in uh, communication studies, which I got my comms degree from San Francisco State University. I actually don't have a science background. I am a public affairs specialist for US Fish and Wildlife Service. So, um, yeah. So oh, for me, it's a bit of a geographic runaround. Um, mostly in the Northeast, though. I did my bachelor's degree at the University of Connecticut in uh, marine science. Then I moved on to a master's in marine biology from the University of Maine. And then down to Philadelphia, where I was at Temple University for my PhD work. And then back up north, uh, towards Boston University for my postdoctoral work. Hopping all over the place. Yeah. Except California, as I learned earlier. I, I have never really spent significant time in the West Coast. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Oof. Got a lot of West Coasters here that are. I know. <laughs> you gotta come visit. You well, gotta okay. come. Maybe you should our, make a change. Our watch, I was feeling really weird last year because our watch name was uh, Vancouver Island because I was. In a, room full of uh, Vancouver, Van, or, um, yeah. Vancouver Van Islanders? Vancouver <laughs> Islanders. Um, yeah, like, it was really weird how that was just happened. Um, so, yeah, not a, not a presence on the West Coast yet. All right, I guess I'll pick up on this thread. Um, once again, I'm Rebecca. Um, I did my undergrad at Union College in Schenectady, New York. Uh, shout out. Um, I have a bio, or not biology, absolutely not. Um, I have a geology degree. <laughs> that was a um, biology burn. 
<laughs> <laughs> I don't deal with the squishy things. That's what happens. Um, but I'm currently at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. Um, and I'm in the second year of my PhD uh, doing marine geology work. I guess I'll go next. Uh, I went to the University of Chicago uh, for political science with a focus on human rights and environmental studies. So I also don't have a formal science background. High five. High five. Woo. Um, but I uh, worked for many years at Monterey Bay Aquarium. And that's kind of where I uh, picked up a lot of the, the science knowledge that has allowed me to traverse different roles on Nautilus. We're I doing academic background. I have a brief request, if I could ask the front row. Um, can we turn on the still cam? Ranger. And if, is, is, can we center up uh, the Herc? HD view, or do we need it? Herc HD is centered. Can we zoom in a little bit past the, uh, the arm, or do you need it out? Yep. There's some really great plankton here. That's why I was just on? pointing that out. Can you, turn on the, can you turn on the yes. DSC for him? Of course. Thanks very much. Is it just me, or does the camera seem a little crooked? I have to sit on one hand and put the other one on the winch. Maybe I won't touch any buttons. <laughs> <laughs> do you want the fidget toy, Dan? <laughs> yes, please. Do you want the globe or do you want the fidget cube? The fidget cube. <laughs> I, I was enjoying that on the last watch. I also have a one pineapple gummy in a bag, but I think it's a lucky gummy, so I don't think Looks you can like have that one. It's way it's too fishing. cute to eat. Yeah. <laughs> you say a lucky gummy? Yeah. You gotta do not the clicking one though. Anything but the clicking cube. <laughs> <laughs> this one? Yeah. <laughs> Roger. So that's how this watch is gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> extra spicy. <laughs> so extra sassy and spicy. Right. Is it Antonella? Oh. Uh, sure. Um, I, well, I went to school. First, I went to community college um, in Glendale in LA County, and then went, did my bachelor's and master's at UC San Diego in uh, computer science and marine robotics. My All my research is focused on marine autonomy with um, cameras, using cameras for navigation. Um, so a combination of computer vision and, and underwater robotics. I'm um, currently a PhD candidate also at UC San Diego, although my research at the moment is based at the Australian Center for Field Robotics at University of Sydney. Um, going to go back there when COVID calms down. Um, yeah, so hopefully get that finished up. But right now I'm kind of doing mostly contracting. Fidgety Dan. Oh. My educational background is sorted. In uh, ninth grade, I got straight Fs <laughs> and decided I couldn't be bothered with public high school anymore, so I stopped going. My parents were totally thrilled about that, so they stuck me in a private school for a year or so. And um, my sophomore year, I took the uh, GED test and, to my complete amazement, passed it. Uh, I was 16 years old and I had a job at a gas station and was driving a Datsun 240Z and started taking classes at the local community college. And then I discovered this video game called Asteroids. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best so back academic background so far. <laughs> I, um, I did really well for a year or two in the community college and then got hooked on Asteroids. And <laughs> Here you are. <laughs> I could turn the machine over all day long with one quarter, so it plays as long as I want. That's and awesome. I got tired of the job in the gas station and <coughs> eventually went to a trade school for a year and learned about uh, electrical things and sparky things. And I uh, wound up eventually getting a job at a company that manufactured robotic arms and was happy there for many years. Um, was a service tech for them and traveled all over. And fixed broken robot arms on ROVs and um, 
started getting interesting in what it would be like to actually operate one of the ROVs and uh, started doing that and wound up going to work for uh, one of the customers and uh, never looked back. So I've been a contractor now for uh, most of this century. <laughs> Have you played Asteroids since the early days? I still play Asteroids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Question coming in. What is Asteroids? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, was the, uh, it was a really silly game where you flew a little spaceship around and blew up rocks. <laughs> Which is kind of like what you do now, yeah. but underwater. <laughs> <laughs> you could say I've had a fascination with the rocks yeah. for a while. Smashing them to be. <laughs> Although we failed horribly yesterday, that was disappointing. Yeah, I've only gotten one verse into that song, but I'll I'll keep working on it as we continue <laughs> trying to crack open rocks. Well, that's right. We're Delta Dan and the band. I miss arachnophobe. Arachnophobe the band. Arachnophobe <laughs> band. <laughs> I guess it's me now. You're up. Uh, I grew up in northern Wisconsin in the middle of nowhere. Probably more so probably in the middle of nowhere than Dan even. Because we were in the middle of the forest. But no mountains because, well, it's Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> I started a marine bio program where I go to what now is Carroll University in Wisconsin. And you finish up at Hawaii Pacific University. So I have an undergraduate degree um, in marine biology from Hawaii Pacific University. And then I decided I also wanted to kind of stick my toes into video and do more ever since I was little, not four months old, but you know, <laughs> when I knew more about things. Sorry, Smith. <laughs> um, I decided I wanted to do kind of more like documentary work and it had anything that had to do with the ocean or water and so I went and got another undergraduate bachelor's degree from the Art Institute of Seattle and so I have a digital filmmaking and video production bachelor's and marine biology and uh, after a couple other like odd end jobs uh, teaching an oceanography what lab uh, working on some different Set movies as a production coordinator and script supervisor, I found myself on a boat running video systems, live broadcast video systems, and now uh, here I am. And I've been coming out for quite some years now, and I also work with, uh, run a whole nother portable video system as well. So there you have it. <laughs> All sorts of different backgrounds. All sorts of different journeys. Yeah. <laughs> and mm -hmm. we all find ourselves here in the control room. I like Dan's story the best. Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised you haven't rigged up Asteroids to one of your uh, monitors here. <laughs> that was not Give an endorsement, ideas. by the way. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh. Oh, no. Don't get need him to pay us. I'm, I'm actually surprised it's not somewhere in the ROV shop. Either. It might be. Or is it? Probably is. Was this a video game? Yes. Yeah, you can get it for free nowadays. <laughs> so like Pong? Back in the day where they had uh, the giant consoles that you stand at. Uh, yeah, it was not long after Pong. Oh, now I'm, I'm getting it like arcade now. game. Like, yeah. Uh, uh, and basically the ship only went left to right and you couldn't make it go up and down. No, you could make it go anywhere. Oh yeah. Yeah, and it had uh, it actually handled a lot like a vehicle because you gave it thrust and then it would drift and you turn sideways. Okay, then I apparently never played it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm getting it confused in my head with Gattaca. Gattaca? Oh, yeah, maybe I am too. That was on a like. That uh, was like a Nintendo. A Nintendo device. Yeah. Oh. Well, I feel like we often get the question, you know, if you're good at video games, will you be good at? driving oh, yeah. an RV, and this is... I've never looked at point. it that way, huh? Nope. I'm horrible at modern video games. I can't even figure out how to work the controller. <laughs> <laughs> Were you just programming a PlayStation controller down there the other day? Yeah, I failed miserably. Okay. I, I got one <laughs> back like here if you want to try it out. <laughs>
Yeah. I was going to say, it looks like Steve Porte has a camera with an Xbox controller. Xbox controller back here. <laughs> I've never played Xbox myself, so maybe that's why I'm bad with the camera. I would encourage uh, model airplanes and drones and uh, helicopters and things that crash and you have to rebuild and fix. It's a lot like an ROV. If you break it, you have to fix it before it works again. Video games, you just hit the start button. So I've crashed a lot of model airplanes. <laughs> So a couple more questions coming in from the viewers about um, what we expect to see. This is going to be for the geologists and the biologists in the room. What interesting and unique geological or biological features, characteristics of this area are you hoping to see? Anything in particular? Yeah, so um, in regards to the geology, we're expecting to find some volcanic rocks, um, ones that may be you know, deposited in lava flows, have some pillow basalt textures to them. Um, but we're also looking for things with a ferromanganese crust, so iron manganese. Um, this stuff is becoming super valuable because it holds a lot of trace metals um, that were depleting on earth, like on land. Um, and so they're very useful when it comes to things like renewable energy, making lithium batteries, that kind of stuff. So just knowing where they are on the seafloor um, is definitely a priority. So there you have it. We'll do a little like dance when we find what you're looking for down there. <laughs> <laughs> what about in terms of uh, like bi biology and life? Oh, yeah. Um, Get my sit rep material in order for tonight. Uh, so the thing that most surprised me about yesterday's dive, yesterday, right? Yep. Uh, was when, as soon as we got on bottom, we found this crazy boulder, right, with all those corals and stuff covering it. That was totally unexpected for that depth. Um, the density of corals and sponges on that rock was higher than any other point shallower, which is really stunning usually don't find that density of animals that deep. So I'm hoping to see more of that uh, at the depths that we're going to be at in the beginning of the dive today. Um, we will see. But I think as, as we get shallower also, I'm expecting equals. to find or hoping to find some uh, some slopes that are less heavily sedimented because we're further away from this step, the island uh, of equals. Palmyra now, but we're also uh, going to be diving in some areas that have a steeper slope, so we hope that sediment doesn't have a chance to stabilize on the slope, and uh, maybe the currents will keep the slope free of sediment. That's my uh, outlook. Sweet. Have we passed the deep scattering layer during this descent? I don't... I don't... I don't know. Um, my memory of the deep scattering layer, it's like a sonar layer where there's lots of activity and life, but um, I'm gonna toss it to the, the current scientists that have probably learned or talked about that more recently than I have. Yep, so we did pass that depth. Um, not sure, precisely sure where it is, uh, I'm sure we have that data. Usually you can see it most clearly in the multi-beam sonar that we have uh, when we're mapping uh, on the bottom of the ship. But uh, yeah, so the deep scattering layer is basically a, a layer in the ocean of, of high densities of uh, animals, uh, combinations of fish, uh, maybe you know shrimp and other crustaceans, uh, sometimes squid, uh, other plankton. Um, that tend to occur at such high densities that they tend to scatter um, any sort of like sound that you send through the water column, like the multi-beam. Um, sometimes the deep scattering layer is, uh, oh, there's Pelagos area there. Um, keep on missing them. But 
you know, a lot of the things that uh, refract and reflect sound in the deep scattering layer are uh, like swim bladders of fishes. So those will often create noise at around the depth of the deep scattering layer, which helps us to identify it. It's usually not too deep, um, you know, a few hundred meters maybe uh, or shallower. And uh, typically animals that might live in this layer might migrate uh, up and down in the water column over the course of a day cycle. Um, you know, feeding near the surface at night and then returning down deep uh, in the in the in the daylight hours. So I know my kindergarten students are learning about the layers of the ocean, and so they're talking about the sunlight layer and the twilight layer and midnight and abyssal plains and all that. What layer are we at right now? in kinder terms. <laughs> uh, where are we? Let's see. Uh, 1,100 meters. So if I was describing it, um, I would describe this as the either the bathypelagic or the bathial zone. Um, you know, this is an area typically, you know, some of the definitions vary, but between about 200 meters uh, where you start to lose light um, from the surface down to about 3,000 meters. Uh, so that's what this zone is probably among the largest in the entire um, t in the entire ocean. So I would translate that for my five-year-olds into the twilight zone. Sure. <laughs> Bathy pelagic slash. It might even twilight. be below the yeah, twilight zone. Midnight? The, the next zone. one would be the Midnight That's Zone. That's right, I heard that in an Octonauts <laughs> episode once. Yeah. The Midnight Zone. So the Daylight Zone, the Twilight Zone. Sunlight, Sunlight or the zone. Photic Zone. And then the Twilight Zone, and the Midnight Zone. And then the Deep, the Abyssal Plains. The Nightmare Zone. No. <laughs> okay, now we're talking about a TV show. O only if there are uh, sea spiders down there, I guess. Oh my yeah. gosh the dinner plate size sea spiders at the at the bottom. Yep. Dinner plate size spiders. That's uh I think Goliath birding spiders get that big. Maybe mm -hmm. even uh some there's actually some species of spider crabs that have even like larger um, leg spans like Seriously, like this. It's not like the Japanese spider crab. Yeah. But it's a crab. Like, yeah, it's not it's a different. <laughs> just <laughs> spider, a sea spider. They are they are not related to actual spiders, right? They are in their own category. The Please sea see, spiders. they're not related to spiders. Uh, like, they're they, not actually arachnids, are they? Uh, <laughs> I you know what? Look now, that now, up. You're, now you're starting to ask me about taxonomic organization of land an animals and I'm uh -oh. kind of losing Have it. We <laughs> so so the, the common uh, level they share with land spiders, I think, is that they're both chelicerates, um, but it, I, they're, I don't believe they're arachnids. What does that mean? Like what categorizes them so as tr the chelicerates? Yeah, that's, it's, it's a specific um, morphology of their mouth parts, basically. Uh, okay. Yeah. So structure is called chelicera. You got, look yep. at that. And you didn't even, did you look at Google? Congratulations. I got an A plus in Your invertebrate biology. Your land taxonomy is going. <laughs> oh, I don't know how to say the word. It says sea spiders are more formally known as pycnogonids. Is that, did I say that correctly? Yeah, pycnogonids. Oh, oh I want to don't look at them on it. Okay, mm. that was a bad call for me. <laughs> I just looked them up. There's so many different types. Look at the size of that one. <laughs> yeah, the, the largest ones are definitely in the southern hemisphere, around the southern ocean. They get quite large. Uh, but the ones that um, uh, I've sampled most frequently are actually quite small, maybe about this big or so, but they still, you know, still weird you out. Yeah. Uh. I'm still trying to decide if I ever want to eat crab again. <laughs> so
speaking of dinner plates size spiders, plate <laughs> what did we have for dinner tonight? Some okay. veggies and some rice. <laughs> yeah, mashed potatoes. <laughs> yeah. Some fresh fruits, so that was nice. Mm -hmm. did not know that we have a sea spider fan viewer um, saying we saw some of the best sea spiders this morning. I think that was probably our watch earlier this morning when we were looking at the sea spiders um, and that they agree that they're not, they look like spiders, but they're not, you know, technically arachnids. They're saying that there's over 1,300 different species of sea spiders. What in the world? Sea spider diversity, Steve? Do you have anything on that? I, I actually don't. Yeah. Um, I've reached the end of my uh, knowledge about knowledge. this group. Yeah. It's, it's still very impressive. I need more information about the sea spiders so that I, um, education helps with fear. <laughs> Are you telling that to yourself or the, yeah. the viewers? Yeah. I think she's telling that to Jordan. <laughs> more information you know better my mom thought the same thing she bought me a book on spiders when i was a kid how'd that go i threw the book away <laughs> <laughs> yeah. were there sea spiders in it no <laughs> no, no picnic goes. not that i can remember I don't think he wants to remember anything that was in the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Steve, you were saying there was some interesting plankton going by, but uh, what what are you looking at? No, I, I was looking uh, for the Pelagicolothurians. We saw a few ah. of them. Yep. Okay. Because I was going to say this sea is cucumbers. Small. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. It's a um, Pelagotheria uh, natatrix is the species. At least there's a, there's one species that we know of. I think there they could be more than one species, but this area, the Central Pacific, is where we find them uh, most commonly. They're kind of you know quite common along the equator, possibly because certain areas are a little bit more productive than others. Um, there was a paper conducted using Nautilus observations uh, published in 2018, I believe, um, where they kind of mapped the distribution of uh, and observations of uh, these Pelagotheria holothurians from uh, exploration ships, basically, the Okeanos Explorer and Nautilus. That was a master's student? Uh, I believe so. I think she's been out here before. Yeah, Gina. Gina. Yeah, yep. Gina. Okay. Gina. Yep. Yeah, those are cool to look up. They look like almost like a, a jelly, like a uh, with a bell, but they're cucumbers, technically. Yep. These are the swimming ones, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they look much different than the swimming ones we've seen. We saw yesterday, day before. Some, at some point. Yep, these more these actually look kind of like squid. Uh, if you look at them from a certain angle, they have kind of like a you know, array of you know, tentacles. Mm. I kind of thought they looked like the larval form of like a moon jelly, but maybe that's very specific. Yep. Or most most jellies actually, but yep. larger. Yeah. surprised we haven't been seeing big um, clouds of anything near the surface. Squid, lanternfish, anything. Yeah. yeah. I guess we haven't been diving at night. 
for the lanternfish. Yeah, and for some reason the birds keep eating them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. Yeah, don't let me leave again alone. <laughs> Fortunately, I think we moved far enough away that the birds shouldn't be bothering us tonight. Or we shouldn't be bothering them, rather. Oh. I suppose you know, we're just the visitors here. <laughs> Here's a cool question Ooh, about siphonophore cameras. Siphonophore. Oh, there's a siphonophore. Take a grab. So Scariest back in the days, we used to ever. call it the longest creature in the ocean. Is that still a thing? That one wasn't, but... The longest <laughs> invertebrate. Like, we used to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Not a thing. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's still valid. There was a, some observations a few years ago that found uh, or estimated its size using laser scalars, which suggested it's the longest creature ever observed. Yeah. Was that the one? Um, it's on Falcor. Yeah. 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 The big spiral. Yeah. The yeah. spiral. Yeah. I think that was. Twenty uh, twenty. Maybe? Yeah, look like a galaxy. Not too long ago. Suspended, though. yeah. <laughs> Question about cameras. Do we ever have infrared cameras on the ROV or low light cameras to look for bioluminescence? Are there any other sorts of sensors? I've never been on when we've had it, but I think we have done something with it before. I know we've gone down, turned off the lights for so long, and then had to turn them back on to see um, what did reappear. But it's kind of hard because our lights are very bright, and our ROV, Hercules, is quite loud and sends off a lot of vibrations. I don't know if Dan was, were you out when they they did something with that? or? Uh, yeah, in that, in that particular instance, we had a power sensor on there. A what sensor? Par. Par. The, uh, sorry, I got two conversations going here. Oh. The um, par sensor is sensing the uh, the light range that uh, plants use. It's common in greenhouses and. Okay. I think it's uh, photosynth photosynthetically available radiation. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. More words than I can say. But I don't think we have anything like that on board today. No. Nope. <laughs> no. We don't, in general, no, we don't have anything like that. It's usually like a visiting scientist will bring it on it when they're studying something very particular. Or something like that, yeah. Got it. Do we ever take gastronomic samples? I don't know. Oh. I think they're asking if we ever sample the samples. Oh, like stomach contents? Yes. Uh, um, not usually, uh, unless there's a very specific purpose um, that is required before it goes into a museum collection. Uh, no, I don't think so. I can't think of an instance where that would be done. Yeah. I can't think of any. I mean, I mean, it could be interesting information in terms of transfer of energy and food web stuff, but. Yep, uh, I think, uh, well, so that tangentially to that, I guess, um, we did some sampling last year for a uh, grad student at uh, University of Hawaii uh, who was studying deep sea food webs and uh, we sampled some sea cucumbers and preserved the gut contents so that they could look at the isotopic signatures that are present in the guts uh, and the sediments to you know, better understand what kinds of nutrients these animals are uptaking and how they recycle nutrients in the benthos. Uh, that, that's not something we did on the ship. We just kind of froze the animal and, and sent it off to them, but um, definitely something that you know is similar to that kind of line of research got it i got a clarification on that question and they're wanting to know if we actually eat samples i'm gonna i'm gonna go with no on that situation no 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 we're fed we're fed very well yeah 
but not by samples. <laughs> We're fed very well, but not by samples. Hey, Steve, are you science right or science left? Science right. That's cool. We gave a very scientific answer for that question, and then they were... <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. Sure. While diving, Jordan, what are you excited about seeing? Um, well, I think I learned a lot about deep sea corals last expedition, or last dive that we were on. So that was really interesting to see and learn about for sure. You ready to identify them by sight? Yeah, I'm not that good. Uh, but also, like, it's just the different sort of sponge formations is pretty cool. I didn't realize there was such an assortment of sponges out there. Yeah. What about you? Um, just want to see something unexpected. We're expecting to see sponges and volcanic rocks and, and deep sea corals. That's awesome, and I want that to happen because that's our plan. But I'm hoping that on our watch we see something unexpected. I would love to see like an octopus or something. I think that'd be really cool. That'd be cool. Like an Archituthis maybe? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, had a question this morning on our watch about finding geodes in the deep sea. Yes. Um, and after processing samples this afternoon, one of the rocks that we pulled up indeed had some geodes in it, which was pretty cool. <gasps> wow. No way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know what the mineral is. Uh, you know, we couldn't run any chemical analysis on it, but if I had to guess, I'd say maybe some calcite. Um, little white minerals in, in t the tiny air pockets um, and one of the basalts. So that was pretty sweet. That's cool, especially since we had just been asked about yeah, the Yeah, I know. So that's a little update. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Geo update. Geodes in the deep. Geodes Indeed. in the deep. Oh, now the geo questions are coming. Um, what type of rocks? Can there be metamorphic rocks? Yeah, that's a good at question. At our location, is there enough pressure to cause metamorphic rocks? Yeah, so in this case, um, on the seafloor, I don't think pressure is going to be the defining factor um, in making these rocks metamorphic per se. I know that we're seeing a lot of weathering, so oxidation on our samples that we've been pulling up. Um, but you can definitely get some uh, some changing of the compositions, right? Some metamorphic uh, kind of characteristics. Places where you have hydrothermal vents, for example, um, there's enough heat there and water interacting with the basaltic lavas to kind of change those compositions. Um, I don't think we're anticipating seeing any hydrothermal vents today on this dive, um, but yeah. It was cool to see the samples that we collected from the earlier watch we brought on board. Yeah. Um, 
they always end up being a different size than what you expect. Right. <laughs> yeah, they're a lot bigger than I thought that. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. It's like. That's the that's the model. Expect the unexpected. Indeed. <laughs> I think now that it's kind of cool as I was in there, I usually expect things when you pull them up from the ocean for it to have sort of a that typical sort of ocean sort of smell. Is. Yeah, I mean, with rocks, I guess you don't necessarily get that um, because we want to try and dry them out as much as we can before putting them in a bag. Sometimes that doesn't happen, though, and so when they get shipped back to the repositories and opened up, they definitely do have some kind of smell to them. Um, but I'm sure the biologic material has more of that, uh, more of a smell to it than the rocks do. We have a super excited viewer that said they asked about geodes in the morning and are super excited to have the follow-up happen. I was hoping that person yes. was on. <laughs> Happy we were able to answer your question. Yeah. Shout out to California. Okay, the geo questions are just coming in like crazy. Let's see here. Do you ever get fossils in the rocks that we collect from the seafloor? That's a good question. Um, sometimes when they get pulled up from the seafloor, right, there are little bits of biology on them. Um, sometimes they kind of look like little, little worms or something like that. Um, but a lot of the time when you core um, in an area of the seafloor or scoop the sediment, um, you end up getting tiny, tiny microfossils in there, right? So those things are called forams typically. Um, they're made of calcium carbonate for the most part, and they're the little shells that a bunch of um, little phytoplankton live in um, in the surface ocean. And then once those animals die, their shells sink down to the bottom of the sea um, and can create these really thick layers um, depending on the level of productivity in the area. And using those microfossils um, from the sediments on the sea floor, you can reconstruct past climate, which I think is pretty neat. That's kind of amazing. Yeah. Wow. These little tiny phytoplankton responsible for us being able to figure out what paleoclimate was. It's pretty sweet. Okay. I hope I get these potential geological terms correct. I'm gonna do my <laughs> best, okay? Is the basalt found down there no. more likely to be porphyric? The power of the pen. Or aphanic? I feel like a, a whip for the... I feel bad. I just messed that up. I don't know. Yeah, no. So those are <laughs> terms that deal with like... <laughs> like I'm thinking um, like holes or not holes? No? Porous not quite. or not porous? Okay. Not quite. Um, so these terms deal with the crystals of the minerals that you can see in the basalts or not. Um, and typically, um, you don't, well, I guess in the samples that we've been pulling up and the ones that we processed today, um, we're able to see a few crystals of olivine here and there in some of the volcanic rocks, um, but not too many at all. And they're not all that big either. Um, so the rocks are seemingly just, you know, in hand sample by eyesight. A little crystal pour um, with pretty small crystals. Cool. cool, so I totally messed up those terms. My <laughs> apology, I am a teacher trained as a biologist and those terms were not familiar to me, but thank you for <laughs> interpreting what I was <laughs> trying to say and providing an answer. Um, next one, this should just all be you here. They're curious about the oceanic crust in our study site and are we going to be seeing relatively new crust in the areas that we're exploring today so 
In terms of oceanic crust, not really. So the the rocks that we'll see, the lava flows um, that will hopefully be there, you know, on these steep slopes, those are definitely going to be younger than the oceanic crust. Um, but the oceanic crust in this region is probably millions of years old, right? So it originated at the East Pacific rise, which is in the or the eastern part of the Pacific Basin. Um, and so, as you move further away from that, the crust gets older. Um, and it's likely pretty covered in sediment, too, on the seafloor. We're pretty far from the East Pacific rise. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> don't mind me asking, where exactly is the East Pacific rise? Um, I don't actually know the latitude and longitude of the areas, but I did go to nine degrees north, East Pacific rise a lot when I was in graduate school. And I can tell you that we flew into Costa Rica and sailed two days west of Costa Rica to get there. So I'm gonna say it's about 250 kilometers west, Costa Rica on the Pacific side. We can look it up. Yeah, no, that's a pretty good estimate. So the East Pacific Rise, um, its northernmost junction, I suppose, kind of goes through um, between like Baja, California, and Mexico. And then it kind of just follows a trajectory south, um, slightly to the west of where like Central and South America are. And it loops all the way around down to the Southern Ocean and connects with another mid-ocean ridge system. Wow. It's like on planet Earth, if we would, if we could take the water off of the ocean, yeah. it's like these, almost like seams on a baseball, mm -hmm. these ridges all around planet Earth where these mid-ocean ridges are. It's kind of cool. Okay, a uh, thank you for your answer regarding the rock terms and the crystals. Our viewer there studies Columbia River basalts. So they were okay. interested in knowing about ocean basalts as well. And nice. then another follow up with the geode, more information, they wanted to know like when we split the rock, did it have a hollow cavity filled with crystal and mineral? Is that what we're referring to? Or was the just a volcanic rock with some sort of Porifitic crystal. <laughs> I'm doing my best here. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so it was really interesting because when the rock was split open, um, it wasn't very vesicular at all. Like it was pretty densely packed, fine grained. Um, but there were a couple of these little cavities, maybe about the size of like the tip of my pinky, um, that had these little crystal formations in them. Yeah, so it wasn't a big hollow, hollow geode, um, you know, like the ones that you kind of bust open in class or whatever. Um, but it was interesting to see. So currently at 1,986 meters, going to get to 2,000 meters step pretty soon. But again, our target is pretty deep, 3,750 meters depth. Um, for those of you just joining us, this dive, we're going to be exploring an unnamed and unexplored seamount south of Pimera Atoll along a 6.7 kilometer transect. It's good. We're going to go up slope from approximately 3,750 meters depth and move toward the summit of the seamount that sits at approximately 1,900 meters depth. The flank of the seamounts are marked by several tall, steep-sided cones that may provide rock sample materials that are important for us to understand the geological history of this particular seamount. 
Additionally, the summits of these cones will be explored for the presence of suspension feeding biology, like our favorites, deep water corals and sponges. They're typically found in higher densities at local topographic high points. The seamount was chosen as a dive target so that we can better characterize the geological underpinnings of the Line Islands region, as well as iron manganese crust geochemistry in the, at these abyssal depths. Kind of cool. So that's what we're doing. We've been at sea for approximately eight days now. Correct me if I'm wrong. And we've got two more weeks at sea for this particular leg of the expedition. Our current dive is going to run about 18 hours, 18, 19 hours, which is a little less than our previous dive at 24 hours, but our transect is a little smaller at 6.7 kilometers. We left port in Honolulu and we'll be returning to the same place at the end of this expedition. And we're currently using um, Hawaii time, but the ship operations run on something called UTC. Universal, Universal time. time. Yeah. Universal time. Universal time, which yeah. is pretty much the same as Zulu time or Greenwich means time. Got it. Oh, midwater biology question. Have we seen any larvations? Uh, I believe so. Uh, we usually see their houses. Um, their houses, uh, by that I mean they Larvations are kind of little, eh, like little tadpole-like creatures, uh, but they're not at all related to uh, you know, frogs in any way. They're uh, uh, small creatures that live in the midwater. They'll kind of secrete a, a mucousy bubble around them, which they use to capture. It's kind of a sticky. It captures all the marine snow and particulate matter around them, and then they can move all this mucus and ingest it. Uh, ingest the, the particles on the, their mucus house, and then every day they shed and create a new house. So the, those will probably see, uh, occasionally you see kind of the remnants of their mucus houses, but rarely do you get a chance to actually see one living. I haven't seen any yet, but next time I see one, I'll try and shout it out. Yeah, Steve, this is Emil down in the lounge. Uh, we uh, did see a nice larvation house uh, in our descent for the last dive. Oh, very cool. So we did see one on the last dive and keep an eye out for more. They're kind of tough to capture screen ga screen grab on the way down because often things are moving very quickly you know we're descending at still 26 meters per minute so things tend to fly by pretty fast that's right and we had our estimates so we'll see we'll mark time when we get bottom and then i'll go back and check and see if our viewers were right on their estimate with that uh, vertical velocity at 26.5 meters. Are we still maintaining that? Oh, 27 meters per minute. Oh. No, wait, that's not right. They had us there at 845. 845. 27 meters per minute. Yeah. Okay, so velocity increased just a little bit. Nice calm weather tonight. I don't think we can ask for better weather. I love that. All right. Some operational questions. Do we live at sea full time? Nope. No. Nope. We, we come out for specific um, 
I guess, specific expeditions that last a certain amount of days. And then the boat does go back in or the ship goes back in to resupply for the next mission. You can check out this entire season's uh, plan, missions, on Nautilus Live website, nautiluslive.com. You can go ahead, go to the 2000.org. Sorry, nautiluslive.org. You can go to the 2022 season and kind of see where Nautilus is going to be exploring this year. Unless they're talking about this excursion, in which case, no, we have not been off the boat at all in eight days. <laughs> <laughs> Nor would you want to. <laughs> where would you go? Nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Questions about the specks that are flying by as we descend. Is that marine snow or is that plankton? What are we seeing as we descend to the depths below? Yep, most of that is marine snow. So it's kind of clumps of organic material, dead skeletons of animals from higher up in the water column. These things, they tend to cluster together and get sticky for, for all sorts of microbes and things as they descend down through the sea, uh, to, through the water column to the seafloor. And uh, oftentimes, yeah, they're, they're great food particles for things that live on the seafloor and that might, might be feeding in, uh, on these types of carbon sources. So yeah, just kind of like debris, dead, dead material. And microbes. Dead ocean stuff and microbes. Yep. The microbes are important because they're breaking down all of the biology uh, and as it sinks down. They're using up oxygen, giving off carbon dioxide, respiring as they go down through the water column. It's a whole ecosystem. But sometimes the, you know, what we're seeing are actually live animals too. There's a number of you know small things like maybe some shrimp or isopods or amphipods that live up in the water column as well, copepods. Uh, and all these animals are you know, living in this three-dimensional space. Viewers wondering if you got to see the large gelatinous tunicate that was found on the last dive and captured in 4K. You were not on watch at that time. What did they we tell did, you yeah, about Yeah, no, it? I didn't see it, but we did see one uh, on our watch with the snail on it. Or am I thinking of our watch? Oh, yeah, the predatory yeah. tunicate with yep. the purplish snail on it. Was that, that was yeah. our watch? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we saw two of those guys on watch. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't we didn't collect any. Uh, not sure if we met our quota for a collection of those, but um, I don't know if they've collect been collected in the area either. A lot of things just haven't been collected uh, at these depths, this part of the world. We have a very large sampling capacity, but uh, we can't get everything <laughs> we need in a single dive, so do we need to do to make sure that we uh, stay within our limits, but also try to collect things that are most relevant to the, you know, science, the advancing the knowledge of biodiversity and biogeography uh, and diversity of life in this part of the world. What would be the weirdest thing you've seen thus far on this particular, on, on this leg? It's a tough one. We only have really one 
one one dive, one full dive under our belts. <laughs> um, I I do think that that tuna kit with the snail on top was kind of Strange. cryptic. Yeah, curious. I'm not sure what it was doing. What was there. it doing? I don't or know. Or is it eating the tuna kit? I would really love to know that if it was, <laughs> because that would be a pretty novel observation. I thought that it was really interesting um, when we saw, I think it was the sea star, um, that you could tell one of its arms was going through a period of regrowth. I thought that was pretty cool. Well, if you were on watch, you know I'm a big fan of the slime star that shows up every now and then. They're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan, did you have a highlight? Uh, you know, this is sort of my first tour of this depth of the ocean, so it's all very new and very fascinating. Um, I would say my non-highlight was the sea spider. <laughs> I think we had two of those. <laughs> and that, was it an amphipod or an isopod that kind of looked like the sea spider, but it wasn't swimming at the time, so you could see its appendages? Yeah, the monopsid isopod, yeah. That was kind of cool, too. Yep. Do we expect to see any seabed nodules? And if so, how long does it take for them to form? And what impact w would we have if we harvested them? I don't. I think this is like cross-section geology, yeah, geochemistry. Yeah. Um, well, we're hoping that we see some, possibly. Um, these, the, the nodules in particular, would be found um, more so in the valleys. Um, but these iron manganese concretions take a really, really long time to form. So they grow at a rate of something like one millimeter per millions of years or something like that. So if you have a really thick crust, you know that that process has been occurring for millions and millions of years, right? Um, yeah. Cool. I think in particular though on this dive, while we are hoping to find some nodules, we're also hoping to find some um, iron manganese crust on actual um, rocks from the seamount. Sure. We were just going over some important front row things, and also I love Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> As one does, <laughs> not to give us away. But. What's going on in science land? <laughs> We're going over the weirdest thing we saw. Ooh. On the last dive. What did we see? Acorn worm. Oh, yeah, that big uh, one. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's oh, worm. the predatory tunicate with the snail? Yep. That was weird, too. Yeah, that's, I think, the most uh, popular one so far. I was surprised it wasn't the uh, slime star. That, I that's said like the a slime star. Oh, okay, I missed that, your you answer know, then. Steve, I thought you said the He ignored my answer. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the slime stars are all that interesting, but they're just <laughs> nothing fun. against slime stars. They're so cute. Was it was it uh, the watch before that there was like a cookie cutter, a cookie sea star or something like that? Can you tell us a little bit about that one? I haven't seen one yet. Is it cuter than the slime star? <laughs> Gotta be. It is definitely <laughs> got a better name. Yeah, we see cookie stars all the time. They um, some of them are pretty vicious predators, so I don't know about cute. Uh, but yeah, squishier, squishier than slime stars. Well, they're more like rot rotund. <laughs> they're pretty calcified. I don't know. They look squishier. <laughs> Maybe we need to get a picture side by side. Why? Why would it be called a cookie cutter sea star? I just I wonder about that. I, I think it's just the the outline they uh, resemble. 
Looks like a cookie yeah. cutter to me. They look like they're stamped out of a roll of cookie dough or something. Is Am anyone I looking this up? Looking at the right one. We are trying to, but now we're just looking at a bunch of cookies, cookies. in the shape of six stars, <laughs> and we want. Now so we want cookies. This one. Yeah. The the family is the Goniasteridae. Okay. Um, KVM. Oh yeah. Okay. No, never mind. Not squishy. But the. Uh, um, I think the slime cookies do look stars nice. cuter. I yeah. mean. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you. This one does kind of make me a little bit hungry. <laughs> it looks like a cracker. <laughs> so, what's the sea star that is like puffy? There's like a. It looks oh, kind of yeah. like a slime like star, a but it's pillow. extra puffy. Yeah. The. Uh, it's probably a brittle star. They. Uh, no. What? The the one that had its, its the center disc was ball puffy. No, 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 we haven't seen one. I'm just thinking previous dives. Extra puppy star. <laughs> now we're looking at cookies again. <laughs> <laughs> Chocolate chip sea star, yes, also. Chocolate chip sea star. Hey Steve, how come we haven't seen any Tina Fors? Are they not um, in this region? Or nothing for them to eat here? Yeah, I mean, you usually find, so there are Tina Fors here. I think we've seen them in, in recent days, um, kind of just in the fruit, first few hundred meters maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you, t you typically find more things in the midwater if you were in a higher productivity area. This is pretty pretty uh, nutrient poor surface ocean uh, occasionally you get you know higher higher nutrient uh, concentrations you know advected up from the equator you know where it fuels some productivity in these latitudes but um, for the most part it's pretty nutrient poor so you don't see a lot of stuff in the surface ocean and for that reason anything that sinks down is pretty also nutrient poor so there isn't a lot of stuff in the benthos, which is kind of why we don't have, uh, you know, massive coral gardens in this area, like perhaps a bit further north. And why is this area so nutrient poor? What makes it different from? It's uh, it, it's largely related to the oceanography of the area. Um, you know, along the.